Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, so the first session here, and I also just first want to thank you, uh, the minister and the president, for uh, uh, introducing the day. And uh, I'm sure they did your excellent uh, uh, speeches on the fantastic innovation ecosystem which, uh, which uh, you're building up in Brazil will be really relevant uh, for this morning discussion here. Uh, so, of course, uh, in this discussion here, the, we are looking at a, a, a trans, a, a, a transforming innovation and what's next. So literally, uh, we are uh, from the conversation or the, the presentations here on how, the, how Brazil is uh, developing uh, its innovation ecosystem in important areas as uh, finance, supplier networks, infrastructure, physical infrastructure, data, IP, and university relationships. We are here on the panel, we have people who are practically are involved uh, in this in Brazil uh, in terms of using the innovation ecosystem and being part of co-creating it. And we also have uh, thought leaders on the panel who have uh, clearly a lot to contribute uh, to the discussion around there. Uh, so just before uh, I introduce who's on the panel, uh, I want to say that this panel here, we are, uh, uh, it is more like a visionary panel. We are talking about what is this future we're all trying to create? How is it going to look like? Uh, what are the uh, ambitions and the goals and the challenges? And uh, this is, of course, always very difficult. Big companies, uh, and as well as uh, uh, companies starting up and scaling up, they are really looking at and investing in the future. Uh, and uh, when visionary things has been uh, said about the future, uh, we can just look back and think, how did people actually describe the future we're living in now? Uh, so I just want to come with one uh, uh, quick uh, reminder of in uh, 1982, there was a famous movie out of Hollywood called Blade Runner. And Blade Runner was talking about two things which we are living in now. The one thing was uh, uh, the information communication technology aids. In Blade Runner, you did not have computers, you did not have mobile phones, you did not have digitalization, and you did not have wireless. So basically, what you had was a, 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 a voice command systems, a, a photocopiers, a, information was exchanged at, um, at a, a corner shops, clearly completely underestimating the the, the, the revolution that ICT had. And of course, we can only look at the future with what we have now. We don't know the unknown of the unknown, but what they completely overestimated was of course biotechnology. They had androids, uh, uh, robots, uh, artificial intelligence, stem cell research has gone well very, very far. So now uh, I'll ask uh, uh, my panel here to uh, create and explain their vision of the future uh, how it's going to be looking and what they're doing uh, in Brazil right now or what they're trying to uh, uh, be influencing to the thought leadership on what could be done and also some of the experiences with actually building and investing and taking to market uh, this future. Uh, and um, I want to introduce uh, uh, on, on uh, uh, right next to me, we have uh, uh, Paul Excel. He is, a, he, he is a founder, founder and CEO of a, something called Accelerating Innovation and also uh, uh, previously have had a major role uh, in British Telecom. If you just take one minute just introducing yourself. Yeah, sure. Uh, and, <clears throat> and thank you. And, and thank you um, to Apex and the Minister, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, for the opportunity to uh, speak on the panel. Uh, so, yes, my name is Paul Excel. Um, I now uh, invest uh, in uh, a bunch of high-growth global digital tech startups. I was previously Group Technology Officer, uh, Chief Innovation Officer, and, and Vice President of Global Services at BT. So I've seen a number of changes through the telco technology uh, media. Um, I've, I've also written uh, a book on, uh, on what makes innovation happen, happen and work, which I'm happy to talk about. Uh, in uh, a little bit more detail as, we, as the panel goes on. Thank but you. that's a little bit about me, so. Fantastic, thank you. And uh, next in the middle we have uh, Klaus Kohne-Fuhlsang, who is Vice President, 
bioenergy, research and development at Novozymes, and also has a world experience across uh, uh, Denmark, Brazil, China, and the uh, United States. If you just one minute, introduce oh, yourself. Thank you. Klaus Fusang, Novozymes. Uh, I'm a biotechnologist of training, so I was a little uh, sad hearing that we overestimate the values and what biotech can do and biotechnology can do. Anyway, I've worked in this field for more than 20 years, a biochemist of education. I learned the business from the Scots since I took an MBA in Scotland. Uh, uh, maybe, you know, so I'm a very, you know, penny wise. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, come from Novozymes, a large industrial company, actually the largest uh, uh, industrial biotechnology uh, company in the world. And uh, we have a business, uh, especially in biofuels in uh, Brazil today, uh, which I'm going to get back to a little bit. Thank you so much. And uh, on, on the far right for me, we have uh, Dan Viles who is uh, uh, the, the Vice President of Corporate Development at Living Planet. Uh, he's probably most well known in his uh, role uh, as a, a former member of Parliament in the UK Parliament and uh, for his presence on the Science and Technology Committee and other committees he has been on or chaired. Uh, and uh, what he's uh, also very well known for this country here is that he's holding two Guinness World of Records uh, one is to uh, be crossing the uh, uh, Atlantic Ocean in a wooden boat, and the other one is to be skiing to the North Pole. Uh, but he's a thought leader and a very good, uh, interesting uh, inspirations on the panel here. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, yeah, most people are more interested in the fact that I rowed across the Atlantic Ocean with my mother in a 23-foot <laughs> wooden rowing boat, but uh, that's not what I'm here to talk about today. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm a former member of Parliament. Um, when I was uh, in Parliament, I had a number of hats that kind of were pulling me in this direction. I sat on the Energy and Climate Change Select Committee and the Science and Technology Select Committee. I chaired the All-Party Environment Group, and I founded and chaired the All-Party Smart Cities Group. Uh, I left Parliament voluntarily, I might add, uh, in May, uh, in order to join the sector, because it's an exciting sector, Internet of Things and Smart Cities. So I work with Living Planet, which is my day job, who are a, a leading technology company in the smart city sector. Um, we work with everything from individual buildings, airports, hospitals, up to, for example, the city of Copenhagen, who recently selected our data platform to be their big data platform. And another hat I have, which we launched literally this week, is I now chair Smarter UK, which is a smart infrastructure initiative underneath the Tech UK umbrella. Tech UK is the UK's largest technology um, trade association. So uh, it's very exciting to be chairing Smarter UK. Thank you. So before I ask all three to give the provocation, uh, I want to emphasize that Brazil clearly now is going to a, a tremendous growth, as we've just heard. Uh, so for example, what Brazil shares with India and China, and now uh, just up and coming, uh, even in uh, Nigeria, is that there are many, many masses of people moving out of poverty to actually becoming part of the growth. They're demanding use of energy. They're demanding a proper house, proper health care, proper education, uh, and uh, basically being uh, uh, consumers in the economy as well. So how are we going to be delivering the health care, uh, the, the, the housing, the energy? At the same time, of course, uh, uh, there's moving up the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the ladder in terms of more into the middle class or, to, or just out of poverty. We also, of course, have the situation with a growing global economy in terms of people. Uh, so uh, there's so many issues. So I think that what I'll have each panelist to do here is to really explain what their vision is on the future, how is it going to look, not day to day, but what are they investing in, in building in 10, 15 years? What is it that they require from the innovation ecosystem or infrastructure to deliver that? And are there any messages to the Brazilian uh, government or the Brazilian uh, uh, stakeholders and supplier networks? Uh, so uh, if I can just start with uh, uh, biotechnology, we heard uh, a lot of that in, in the speech. Uh, so uh, Klaus uh, Fulsang, if you'll begin. Sure, sure. Uh, so so uh, world population is growing, that's a fact. Uh, Nine billion people in 2050, a lot will have come out of poverty, the increasing the demand for stuff. And with stuff, I mean materials, chemicals, foods, feed, 
and of course energy. And uh, we built a society, a modern day society, uh, thrives on cheap energy, try cheap energy in the, in the form of fossil energy to a large extent. Yes, we are talking about renewables and that is taking up a larger part of it, but we simply need to break this dependence of growth towards use of finite resources and pollution that comes with that. Uh, we believe uh, biotechnology has a major part to play in that, uh, both in the agricultural sector, increasing the output from agricultural and forestry sectors uh, through smarter uh, production and better production with less input. Uh, that's a requirement. Then we believe we can create the circular economy, if you will, uh, actually having a major part of what we need in terms of uh, food, feed, materials, chemicals, and fuels, and bioenergy coming from renewable resources. And here, Brazil is actually uh, quite on the leading side with a very large, already today, uh, biofuels production and a very large output in terms of uh, these commodities, in terms of agricultural products, in terms of forestry products. Uh, so, so what we are trying to do in, in Brazil is actually to go through this development, not only using the crops, the, the actual sugar cane, but also the biomass, uh, the waste, the trash, whatever else is actually produced or co-produced when you produce feed and food products uh, that, that are just left there and actually contribute to CO2 emissions by just being fermented in the soil. Uh, you can do that and companies aren't doing that uh, in Brazil. Uh, Rai Isen uh, is building or have built a factory in Costa Pinto uh, at the Piacicaba. Uh, Grand View in Alagoas in northern Brazil, and they are getting there. They're starting up these productions, but it's an enormous investment, and it's an enormous undertaking. You are up against industries that have been optimized for 50 or more years, uh, an oil industry. And you have, in Brazil, and that's a little bit of a provocation maybe to Brazil, you even have to compete against subsidized fossil fuels uh, to some extent, and they are doing so today. Uh, so, 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 so technologies are there, they're being developed around the world uh, to, to do the biotechnology parts of it, we are part of that. Uh, but, but, but what we need is really the demand side. Politicians daring to set and, and actually wanting to set a future that doesn't depend on finite resources that will run out and, on and increase in cost. I know that oil prices right now are low, ever, you know, pretty low. Uh, so that's of course a challenge when you talk short term but longer term also to break this curve of pollution and, and use of finite resources and replacing it by something else which is actually right in front of our noses. Thank you very much. Uh, so of course uh, we move on to the, to the next uh, provocation, but uh, I'm sure that everybody here when we start the discussion would want to know from you uh, why, uh, what the incentives is, why, the, why, why, why you shouldn't be competing against uh, 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 the local uh, uh, oil and petrochemical industry. What is it that you have to offer? Where well, they should listen to you. Uh, so, but we'll come back to that. Uh, so, if we can move on to uh, to, 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 my, uh, uh, to Dan on, on, on the far, far right. Basically, uh, um, we are here looking into the digitalization and what that has to offer. Uh, and if you can uh, speak for some minutes of that. Absolutely. So um, to build on the themes we've just heard, of course, we have a growing population, but we also have changes within that in that we have changing demographics. Many parts of the world are facing uh, uh, problems of an aging population. We have growing middle classes. Population want to consume more and have higher expectations. And there's a real challenge here in increased urbanization. So the, we now passed the tipping point where more than 50% of the population live in cities, and that is projected to rise to 65, maybe even 75% by 2050. Um, the challenges that creates, particularly around infrastructure and resilience of infrastructure, are phenomenal. The world is urbanising at the rate of 1.3 million people a week. London alone is growing at the rate of one full tube train every three days. Now, just think of the challenge that creates for urban planners. We, it's predicted that by 2030, we will need $57 trillion of infrastructure investment globally. We'll be using 50% more food than we were in 2012, and we'll need 45% more power. This at a time when there are already people on the planet who don't have access to reliable food, reliable power, reliable clean water. That's challenge number one. Challenge number two is this growth of disruptive technologies, particularly in the digital sector, Internet of Things, um, smart cities technologies. And that is a challenge because it is disruptive. They call it disruptive for a reason. And that there are people, there are industries, there are sectors, there are companies who will find themselves disrupted 
if they don't wake up to this change. But it's also exciting because harnessing the power of this disruptive technology of the Internet of Things is part of the solution to the first problem, which is as we have this growing infrastructure problem, we need to use IoT and smart city solutions to create smart infrastructure that is data-led, data-driven, connected, and just very, very briefly, breaking out of the traditional way of silos. So breaking out of the idea that we have an energy solution here, a healthcare solution there, a transport solution there, they're not connected, they're not connected at data level. And the fascinating thing about digitization and the growth of data is it referred to the scarcity of resources. Data is the one type of resource that is not scarce because data can be replicated virtually for free. And when I consume a piece of data, I don't prevent you from consuming a piece of data. So as digitization is spreading out into more industries, not only are we seeing the power of Moore's law starting to creep into other industries, but of course, we're entering a world where a key economic resource actually is not scarce. And that raises completely different issues around how we manage it. And uh, as you're speaking, one of the things uh, you, you know, when we come back to, you can think about maybe is that a, a major part may of, of uh, the Brazilian population might be living in uh, favelas or not being connected in the, and actually what is the opportunities we can offer to them to kind of, to become part of the economy. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, and uh, also here to uh, Paul Excel talking about uh, Startup, scale up, uh, the 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 young or the new or the innovative moving forward uh, to deliver uh, the future of Brazil. What do you have to say? Uh, thank you, Brigitte. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I suppose uh, we were talking a lot about futures, uh, and certainly when I when I was arriving this morning, uh, I, I thought I was going to be moderating a panel later in the day, and I wasn't going to be on this panel. So sadly, one of our, our colleagues had had to drop out. So. I think it's kind of interesting thing about you can do as much prediction uh, as you like, but you also have to be able to respond. Uh, and responsiveness is really, really important. Uh, typically, I think we all underestimate, or sorry, overestimate the impact of technology uh, in the short term and then underestimate what it's going to have an impact in the longer term. I think uh, Gates might have even said that one. Uh, I was laughing that... Uh, uh, I recently did a presentation on, on innovation and what makes a difference. And on looking back to, uh, I think it was a front page of a, uh, a leading UK newspaper, not the Telegraph, I hasten to add. Uh, they had this headline, big dramatic headline, uh, I think it was uh, 1991, and said, uh, and it was Tim Berners-Lee, the, the, if you like, the founder of, of the World Wide Web and the Internet, and it basically said, uh, millions around the world being connected by the Internet. And in a rather sarcastic term, they said, yeah, right. OK, so it looks like my mic. Oh, so that's a bit better. Um, and, and of course, now the internet is, is fundamental to our lives. It's connecting people, all the, all the things that Dan said about you know, removing silos and so on. Uh, I, I simply, in terms of startups and scale ups, finding great ideas is actually fairly easy. I mean, in, innovation, if you Google it, um, and remember, Google wasn't, hasn't been around that long, if you're thinking about it. But if you Google it, you'll get so many, you'll, you'll get so many hits on what does it mean. You, kind of, you, you have a tyranny of choice, as I call it, in terms of... But fundamentally, what it comes down to is an idea which has been uh, executed, delivered on an end-to-end -end basis. And finding the idea, frankly, is really, really easy. There's smart people all around the world. There's lots of smart people in Brazil, uh, and I've had the pleasure to work with them. The real trick about how you make those into something that's going to make a difference to your society, uh, drive your shareholder value, whatever is important to you, innovators will have a cause, uh, is the understanding of how you put together the skills, the ecosystem, the ability to collaborate. Um, and as I said, I have this little seven C's model. Collaboration, not surprisingly, is, is one of them. Um, it's very hard for you to be unique uh, these days in the global economy. Somewhere out there, there is a smart person in the world, on, on the seven or eight million, billion of us, who've come up with the idea. The ones that win are the ones that can pull it together in a compelling proposition or can make a difference. So when I look at what makes a difference, it's how can you pull together those ecosystems of people with the right skills, the right capabilities. Um, so it's not just finding them, it's the ability to... Uh, to, to commercialize them, and this is not just te technical, it, it's finding uh, smart investors, it's finding the right environments and, and, and so on. So uh, I think collaboration is really important uh, and really understanding uh, 
very much, if you have some IP, great, defend it and think about it. It's great to hear the minister talking about what you're doing in terms of global collaboration on IP and that kind of stuff. But for me, the key differentiator is speed. How can you get out there and really understand and get direct citizen or customer feedback? Because you can sit in focus groups, you can do a lot of things, and unless you're really understanding what the market, what customers, what citizens need, testing it, testing your proposition, and pivoting, uh, changing, evolving, then that's the thing that makes the difference. Um, in terms of the future, five to ten years, uh, it's almost impossible to, uh, to clearly uh, predict. Maybe we'll get into that. But I very much agree there's a real opportunity, this industrial internet, internet of things, of you know, 50, 100 billion, 200 billion every time it goes up in terms of uh, all of us with 1,000 internet addresses. I think that's a real opportunity. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, something I, I think it's well enough you say that uh, we need to uh, build the networks around, uh, around scale-ups and startups. But Brazil has the same problem as we have in Europe. When they want funding, they go to Silicon Valley or they, or they go to China. And uh, in fact, uh, the Big Innovation Center, we work with a growth accelerator in Brazil that goes to Silicon Valley, and we do the same thing all over the UK. The key here is that the companies who have scale, who started or who want to scale up, what they have on the uh, balance sheet is not physical buildings, raw material, or, uh, you know, or, or lots of people, what they have is ideas and technology and IP, and banks just do not bank against that because they cannot measure the value of it as a collateral. As a, so what happens is that people take loans for their houses or everywhere else, or they look to, to uh, sell out, or they go abroad for finance, and then they, in that, uh, they also sell off equity or the IP and some abroad. Uh, Europe has only had three companies who had actually managed to go from small to big uh, uh, in terms of huge, like Google or other, within the last uh, 35 years. And Brazil has, is facing similar things when we speak with the startup communities. So you can think about uh, uh, how, uh, you know, how you would go to advise there. So, okay, so we have three subjects just from this here. Uh, we can give a brief uh, feedbacks for, and then we can also have some discussion with the audience here. So, uh, supplier networks, uh, Klaus, why <laughs> should uh, the minister think about you rather than uh, his own people? <laughs> Why, 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 why should the minister, you know, you, you were complaining oh, yeah. about you were competing against subsidized sure. oil industry. Why should he look at you and say, well, that's where I want to put my money? Sure. No, no. <laughs> uh, but it, it, it's about uh, the price of carbon. It comes back to that. The, the, not just taking the carbon and burning it in some way or another, but, but actually taking and replacing it by a new uh, carbon. And the implication that use has on society, environment, and so on. And if you take in that full cost, you can actually, uh, uh, and it's done. It's done in Brazil on sugarcane ethanol. Today, Brazil uses 25 to 20, they actually up the, uh, the implant demand to 27.5, uh, I think, uh, percent of the gasoline mixture is actually from renewables. So, so you, you know you can do it. So it's about increasing the supply chain for that through not only using sugarcane, but also using the waste materials uh, that otherwise goes un underutilized. Uh, and okay, that's a, you know, a higher, uh, 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 a lot more difficult to crack than the original one. That's why it was first, uh, right? Uh, now this uh, generation of fuels, what we call second generation of fuels is on the way, but the investments re that required, not only requires companies with a very large balance sheet, and Raisen is a company with a very large balance sheet, but one factory that produces, say, 40 uh, billion liters comes close to the cost of 200 million reais. It's huge investments that ha has to go in there. And you don't get it first time right. You don't just build a factory and then you think, ah, that's it, that's my prototype, I'm gonna now build 40. No, you, first you have to make it work. And if you look across industries, what it takes to make a thing work, and even known industries, when they start up, it takes one, two years to uh, commission 
a new plant in any, more or less any new, uh, uh, or, or, or uh, for any new plant, right? And here we're talking about a completely new industry. So, so, so security that when when we do investments of two hundred million uh, million arise, there's a future for our products. It, it's not going to you know sway with tides of oil going to forty dollars a barrel or eighty, and then we're all fine. But 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 uh, you need some certainty that. You know, I can actually, yeah, so oh, sorry. The, the message is here that yeah. uh, you are building waves in the supplier network and you're creating sustainability and, 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 and they have unused resources uh, which they could be utilizing, uh, which doesn't need subsidy, but actually you're having a huge demand for. Uh, if I move to, uh, uh, to Dan, uh, the Internet of Things, digitalization, have actually across the world caused higher inequality it is the poor, the less mobile, uh, and, and, and then the elderly who find it difficult to be part. Why, how should Brazil, with this extreme already huge inequality, how should they jump on the bandwagon and say, now we can go get cohesion? This is a real challenge. I mean, we already have the term, uh, the digital divide. We use it in the UK, that people who are connected, they have broadband, they have smartphones, have access to services and goods perhaps cheaper than, than, than traditional methods. It's one of the attractions of the digital economy. Um, but what about the people who don't have them? What about older people, poorer people, perhaps who don't have the same connections? And so the concept of the digital divide is very real, and it predates the Internet of Things. So. Our challenge going forward is to make sure that smart city technologies, the Internet of Things, doesn't exacerbate that. We mustn't end up in a world where smart cities means ever shinier, gated communities in the centers of cities that work for the rich, that work for businesses, but exclude people. It has to be part of the solution to the challenge. It mustn't be an exacerbator. And, and I wouldn't stand up here and say we know all the answers to how we can make that happen yet. I mean, I've had this conversation. I was in Hyderabad uh, in India last year, and I was discussing this with the chief minister of, of Andhra Pradesh. Uh, and he raised the point. He said Hyderabad wants to be a smart city, but up to a third of the population of Hyderabad at the moment don't have access to reliable clean water and clean energy. What does a smart solution mean to them? Now, this comes back to my point where Although IoT is often thought of in the terms of the consumers, consumers doing exciting things with their smartphones, now that is a key part of it. I actually think the fundamentally interesting bit is about infrastructure. So we need resilient urban infrastructure, whether that's power networks, whether it's water networks, that work for everybody in the community, including the poorest, because it's the poorest who suffer most when infrastructure is not resilient. And with this urbanization challenge, urbanization is happening anyway. That's not a choice. It's going to happen. And if we don't plan for it with smart, sustainable, resilient infrastructure, we will have favelas, we will have slums. And we need to try to make sure that our planning process, and this is the challenge, it's, it's what's the interaction between government and centralized planning versus this vibrant ecosystem of sort of you know, small companies creating innovation. And it's how do, we, how do we make those work together? Because if you let it happen entirely independently of government, then you end up with incoherency. But if you get the government to sit down and plan what a smart city will look like in 2050, they will get it wrong. You know, I'm an ex-MP, and I can tell you, they will get it wrong. Yeah, so, uh, and so yeah. it's about government putting in place the underlying infrastructure and the enabling sort of legislative frameworks to try to make sure this happens in a sensible way without smothering the innovation that is going to... Because we don't know what that smart infrastructure will look like in 2030 or 2040. Mm -hmm. But what we do know is that this exciting, innovative, sort of disruptive technologies are creating new ways of doing this that are going to be really exciting. Would you, would you go as far as saying that the government could be a public procurer? So, for example, in India, digital health is something that the government really has invested in and part of delivering. Do you think that the, the kind of public procurement for uh, public services yeah, could be a way to, to, to develop it? And I actually think that the procurement process is a key driver because it, you can use it to nudge yeah. without necessarily dictating. In fact, even here in the UK, just to give an example, um, the Ebbsfleet Garden City, which is going to be a new city, well, a new suburb, um, the high-level master planning document that came from the government posed a question. It simply said, when you're tendering to do the master planning, how will you use smart city thinking and smart city technology? It didn't dictate what they thought it should look like, but it planted the question, which meant everybody submitting that tender had to think about that. And I think we'll see a lot more public-private partnerships in this space, where, the, where the, the governments are doing the enabling, but they're not stifling what the final answer looks like. Yeah, fantastic.
fantastic. And, and Paul, the major question, uh, how do you keep your best entrepreneurs at home? Uh, how do you actually not just start this place where they get the mentoring and get a little bit of incubating in houses, but how do you actually make sure that they, uh, how can Brazil coin it, the rest of the Europe and, and, uh, and UK has problems, but what can Brazil do? What are, how, what, how can they coin it to keep the entrepreneurs to roll up finance, lending or equity? Um, I can go to the so it's a great question. I think again one of my one of my C's is really, uh, seven words uh, what great innovation is about uh, beginning with the, uh, the, uh, the 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 letter C is cause uh, and a lot of particularly millennials and people want to be involved in something that's making a difference. They may also want to make themselves fabulously rich and that's a cause that some people might have. But more and more you're seeing uh, people who want to be involved in ethical. Uh, they, they have high moral and uh, in, you know, integrity, and they want to work, uh, and they want to make a difference. Uh, and I'm with Dan on this one. I'm, I'm, I'm a, a supreme optimist. That I'm, I'm, I can see s some of the issues of, clearly, that we talked about, digital divides and, and digitization and, and so on. But if I think about the de democratization that's come as a result of the internet, uh, seven or eight billion people are starting to have the opportunity to be part of all this. And yes, not everybody is part of it yet, but there is hope uh, that, that we can. Here in the UK, our public health service, which has looked after my family for many, many years and is precious to us, I think has to ha look to t technology to find a way of delivering what patients need, uh, which is an ongoing challenge on both uh, the, the technology and clearly medical science, but also the, the exchequer and, and, and taxes, the fine. So I'm very, very, uh, very, very um, sanguine, optimistic uh, that technology is the right way forward. And I think in answer to your specific question, I think there, are, there, are, there is money around. Uh, people uh, and people both in the UK and Brazil need to be thinking about this short, medium and longer term thinking and, and planning. And when you have a, uh, a, you know, a government uh, working with the private, private sector uh, in an in innovative way, you get the sort of things that Dan was talking about, a vision of where infrastructure is going so you can deploy and unleash smart, small companies to do the innovation. And I think the people within it can really see that they're making a difference. They're not yeah. banging up against bureaucratic yeah. walls. Yeah. Sure, sure, surely the issue is that, of course, government, we can always look to government, but what about, what about the banks? What about the crowdsourcing associations? What about the venture capitalists? What about the business angels? What about all kind of private ways in which we can create incentives for them to invest so they don't go for the big money in, in Silicon Valley or other places? But we can come back to that the audience. So what I want to say, we have, here we have been discussing sustainability, uh, infrastructure, supply chains, uh, Internet of Things, data, IP, internal finance. Uh, I think we should get some uh, questions and engagement uh, with the fabulous audience we have here. And uh, please uh, put your hand up uh, if you, and, and I'll take like three questions in a row and <coughs> also say who you are uh, and if there's any particular you want to answer the, your question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Can, yeah. can I put a yeah. question forward? Yeah, 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 yeah. You can, yes, and you yeah, yeah. Uh, there will, yeah, there's a mic, yeah. Hi, uh, Chris McIsomini from a company called Intelligent Energy. Um, this is probably mainly directed at Klaus. Um, with the competing, maybe antagonistic rise of the rapidly urbanization that Dan spoke about, um, how does the multi billion investments in plants and infrastructure meet that resilience where it seems like a more distributed energy future would be better for those rapidly urbanizing cities and to lift people out of poverty. Sure. Uh, so then you're, you're basically also talking about, about the tr transportation systems in urbanization, how to best provide energy for that or what are the best means of, that, of doing that and of course electrification and, and public transport it will play a major role in the future. I'm not, I'm not in doubt of this. Uh, we, we still need land transport. There will, I mean, there will still be goods to be moved around. There will still be flying. There will, you know, uh, so 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 there's still a future for liquid transportation fuels, most likely. But in in sense of urbanization, it's about getting electricity in to a large extent and 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 and, and providing that as a service for everyone. That can also come from biomass. 
part of, uh, especially uh, uh, units uh, being built in the US and Europe, has an, uh, it is an integral part of the biofuel systems in, 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 in uh, Brazil, is to produce electricity from, uh, from also leftover uh, unutilized un biomass. And yeah, so please. Yeah, just want to um, and, um, absolutely echo that point, but also this is not just about energy, it's also about waste and waste management systems, and it's about transport and congestion, because if we want to embrace the concept of the circular economy, which starts to say that, uh, I see people smiling, and <laughs> that, uh, you know, there is, there sh we're going to reach a stage where there's no such thing as waste. Everything is a resource for something, and if we can take what at the moment are waste products, use them to create energy as close as possible to where they're created, then you start to resolve transport issues and waste management issues and energy systems. So I, I agree absolutely with your point distributed systems, microgrids, linked with innovative new ways of creating energy, that act, the knock-on effect you start to get across different sectors and different parts of the city. And this is you know, one of the sort of definitions of a smart city is a systems of systems approach, where you stop viewing each system in isolation and see how they can be mutually compatible. Yeah, yeah, thank you. It is, uh, yeah. Put a comment towards the waste part. It, it is actually also part of uh, some programs to uh, develop systems to utilize waste for I, you know, f fueling biogas or electricity or even biofuels also. Yeah. 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 Um, yes, my name is Sandra Sasso. I'm the CEO of CAB Energy. We do on-site waste conversion. So uh, really focused on future cities and integrating into the fabric of the city. The biggest challenge we're having is getting people to change. Yeah. Uh, everything is centralized. Everything is about movement of waste to big centralized facilities to then be reconverted into electricity that can be transported. How do you, when governments are investing and co-investing in centralized facilities, how do you break that, that trend? And how do you move forward into new and new technologies that are available and incorporating those for the future? Yeah. Should we just have, is there any, one more question? Okay, yeah, Klaus. I, I don't know if I'm the right one to speak on how you get governments to uh, incorporate it in, <laughs> in the plans for the future. But, 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 but uh, I mean, you have to work with governments and city councils, uh, also as a technology <coughs> provider, uh, to move them in that direction. Uh, you know, we have talks in Copenhagen around that, uh, using our biotechnology to do just that. Uh, but but it's, it is hard. I mean, uh, uh, I don't know if Dan has a better view. Well, I think there's a number of issues here. One is there's this corporate risk-averse culture that we get, not only in some large companies who perhaps are not so keen to talk to a small, innovative supply chain, they'd rather go to their traditional supply chain, but also local authorities and governments. You know, and some people are a bit cautious of being pioneers in this space mm -hmm. um, for understandable reasons. Uh, and you're right, you can't get this away from the planning process and government and master planning process. And, and I think it will be slow to change. And we're seeing, uh, what we see is very frustrating as my Living Planet hat on, is we often get called in after all the basic master planning's been done and said, can you help us now with the technology plan? And we say, well, yes, we can, but what a shame you didn't involve us at the start, because we're now going to have to retrofit what we're thinking to all the old-fashioned rubbish you've already put into your master plan. Uh, and some cities are trying to get ahead of this. And we're going to see some interesting, so coming back to the UK again, you know, things like um, the old oak common development. You know, they're trying right at the start to think about this differently. And they've got a bit virtually a blank sheet of paper. And they have the opportunity, I hope, to demonstrate that it really works. But we don't yet have enough examples around the world that you can point to and say, look, they did it there, they did it there. They had an X percent return on their investment. Quality of life went up and it worked. I think we all kind of know this is going to work and we've seen small pilots. And the challenge for this kind of sector, it's multiple sectors, is to get beyond small scale pilots funded by grants and to get into demonstrable business models that show that this works and it works for everybody. And it's not going to be easy, but I do think we're getting there. And I think there's a momentum building. And, 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 and the way in which uh, we are uh, trying to get there in the UK is, uh, of course, by building open labs. And this is all that you're saying in the States. I'm sure you're also doing it in Brazil. Uh, you can encourage them more if you don't. So that means that companies are investing in like Google Labs, Intel Labs, Juniper Networks Labs, uh, uh, Barclays Design Space to invent finance. You have a Royal Bank of Scotland's Innovation Gateway. There are all these open spaces and open labs. And what they're doing, they're, they are co-innovating the innovation ecosystem because everyone says that they cannot do it alone. 
So uh, for example, what we do at the Big Innovation Center, we, uh, we can do like living labs, we can work with labs to uh, increase their lab capabilities, and these labs are sitting outside traditional research and development units of companies because if you want to develop, develop a smart transport system or a smart health system or a smart energy system, you have to do it with the ecosystem, not alone, otherwise it doesn't grow. And, uh, and, and you cannot really deliver and everybody will be wasting their resources and fighting. So this is, uh, has been very much the way in which large companies are going about it. So the key here is also they're trying and they're doing that. They're a catalyst for small and medium-sized enterprises. And, uh, and they're also catalysts for working with citizens, even if they want to social labs like dementia-friendly communities. It's not one organization deliver that. That's the community. Uh, so just to put out a provocation of the way we deal with it. Yeah, you have? No, I, don't, I, 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 I think, I, I don't think you can over uh, sort of, uh, 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 you can over, it, the most important thing I think about is think about innovation in, in commercial models and short, medium, long-term thinking. Because the technology can look after itself. Today's whizzy technology is tomorrow's legacy. Um, and so I've been a technologist and technology pioneer all my life. I'm very, very also optimistic about engineers and their ability. If you give smart women and men a problem statement, a clear problem statement, they'll find smart commercial ways of doing it. The key thing was, was again, picking up one of the Dan's themes. It's because I, th I think you can do labs, you can accelerators. We do lots of those, and that's fine and dandy. You get to a proof of concept, minimum viable product, and it all looks good, and you, we're all doing the lean startup stuff, and, and, and that's good. And you have to do that, by the way. I'm not knocking it. I'm, I have a number of people, and I, 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 and I support all those concepts on a pro bono basis. The key thing, if you want your economy to be successful, is that transition and to get an attitude in government and big companies, one of which I used to work for, that you don't lose your job if you pick IBM. You don't lose your job if you pick large companies. So, you know, this is not a knock at IBM, by the way, because they are a great company, and I've got lots of friends there, and, and I, it's uh, not pop. But there is a on prevailing culture in government and in large companies that you cannot go with this these small guys because all these smaller companies as they're up and coming because that's just too risky. So you need to find a way that, you know, understands, manages those risks and creates a commercial model which makes sense. Then then the, the, the thing turns around because I if I have a good idea, I don't have to find any problem today funding it. Probably the banks are the hardest people to get money from, but there's lots and lots of money for good ideas and good people sloshing around the economy. So Should we just take one or two more questions that have quick replies, yes? Quick question, quick replies, yeah? Oh, I didn't even have to take it, yeah. Okay. Got to be quick. Hi, <laughs> I am uh, Maeve Hall from Unilever. Thank you for your suggestion <coughs> about big companies looking for <laughs> small businesses that are uh, more innovative. So uh, I look after the uh, manufacturing portfolio from a sustainability perspective. We've just achieved our zero non-hazardous waste to landfill targets. We have also just about to launch some new targets on how we're going to achieve our renewable energy commitments. Um, and Brazil being one of the, our most progressive countries. Um, what I want to know is two things. One, you've partially answered, is what can companies do to stimulate the market even more? Um, and two, the drought in Brazil is really affecting our business, probably a lot of other businesses. I haven't heard anything yet today about the water industry and um, and um, what companies are doing in the space, but I'd really like to understand whether you've seen a, um, a change and an increasing innovation in the water sector as well. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, do we have one more question? No? Yeah? Sorry, yeah, Sandy, you mentioned uh, Robin Ibbotson BA systems. Mm -hmm. uh, Robin Ibbotson BA systems. You mentioned earlier on about um, the system of systems when it comes to these future cities and, and innovation and integrating these all together. Where do you think the ownership of that lies between industry and the government when it comes to that? Lots of competing different elements all plugging together. There's a risk there when things don't work. Um, it, it, does that lie with us as an industry or innovators, innovators to try and solve those problems or does it ultimately lie with the government? Okay, so we've got two questions. One is uh, uh, water is clearly a very, very important resource, probably <laughs> the most important of everything. And the other thing is that when you're innovating the innovation ecosystem, who is accountable? Uh, I'm sure uh, everybody has uh, comments on that. So we get comments, if, if, if we have comments on this and afterwards, each speaker will have their, uh, their rounding up comment. But uh, first, quickly, to answer these two questions, uh, if anybody wants to. 
Okay, well, I'll jump in just firstly on that one. I think um, you know, utilities as a whole are slow to innovate. I think the water sector is arguably even slower than the energy sector uh, to innovate um, for a variety of reasons. Certainly um, in many parts of the world they are. Um, there's no magic bullet to it, but I really do think that uh, water has not been seen as a precious enough resource in too many countries, and, and we're rapidly waking up to the fact that that's not good enough anymore. And a lot of the standard smart city stuff about sensors, actually understanding what's going on in the network, actually understanding where water's being lost, where it's being used, and how it's being used, can give us a much better picture towards being able to manage our water more effectively. And, and on that question, it's a really, really good question. And I, and I think it's one of the risks that people are still see for this when they're grappling with it. Uh, most of the cities we're involved with are a sort of a public private finance, uh, sorry, um, a consortium effectively. So we're operating in Copenhagen, we're operating in Exeter. In both cases, it's, it's, an, it's a, co a consortium of the local authority who are putting in place an underlying infrastructure, in both cases principally a, a smart city data platform, upon which they are then inviting private sector partners to come uh, and sort of you know, play in a common space. Um, and actually in both those cases, they set up an arm's length kind of government owned, but run slightly independently body to do it. Uh, but I think we're still evolving how the governance looks. And it's, and we can have a whole conference, I think, on the governance structure of the smart cities. Uh, it, it is one of the perceived risks, I think, that is holding some of this back. Thank you. And I could know that Unilever, uh, um, I, I heard that from your R&D unit in Put Sunlight, that you're using big data also to work with the Natural Environment Research Council, uh, their data and other companies' data to solve the water challenge. Uh, do we, do, is there any comments to the two questions? No. Quick, a quick very, answer. Very, yeah, sure, sure. I mean, uh, I think the other one that, that, I, that I definitely with, we, we, uh, interesting over at BT, we used to have to spend a lot of time trying to get water out of our ducts and stuff, so we used to do a lot of uh, things around. Big data is definitely something to, to look at and, and smart ways of, of, of reducing leakage and filtration. The other thing is, is my, my favourite this morning almost is coming back to commercial models. Even though I'm an engineer, is, is as I understand it, you have to write off you know, water plants, treatment plants, over a long, long time, and I know that RWE and Thames Water here in the UK, when I was working with them 10 years ago, were trying to do some really funky, interesting things about how you look at innovative commercial models. So remember, innovation is not just about technology, it's about yeah. process, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So Thank you. Yeah, last uh, just one quick comment on the water. It is a scarce resource, and you have to realize that, that both as a society, as a, and, but also as a, as a, as a um, responsible players in industry. And, and, and providing you know, savings targets, and, and, and there's plenty of opportunities to do that uh, in, in the various industries to go down in, in our water consumption and establish systems as to how to measure it. And much, much is simply lost in the system, yeah, in the infrastructure. How much is lost away, right? hmm? yeah, exactly. exactly, so I think we have, a, we have a blinking light here. We're definitely <laughs> uh, ready to close now. Uh, I just want to say, is there anything you're burning to say, the message to the Brazilian government, the message to a, a government's full stop, the message to industry, kind of one thing you want to triumph when you, you, have, you haven't said it, then uh, you're regretting it, so uh, well, one, one message. Okay, I'll kick that off. This isn't about technology. Few of, the, few of us have said that already. Actually, this is about a mindset. It's about an attitude. It's about an attitude to using data and connectivity about to breaking out of silos and to understanding that this brave new world going forward will have to be different. We can't keep doing the things the way we used to a bit more efficiently. We are going to have to fundamentally change the way we do things if we're going to face this urbanization challenge in a sustainable way. Yep. I would yep. chime into that. It's about the mindset. It's about the framework. Technology will deliver if the framework is given and the direction is set. And uh, that, to a large extent, happens uh, from, from populations, societies, opinions, and, of course, politicians. So I, I wrote down uh, what makes a difference. Three things. Skills, culture, ecosystem. Nurture and develop it. Yeah. And uh, uh, I think that uh, we've had a, a fantastic discussion. I think that we've always been very inspired by the morning uh, 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 provocations and presentation and hearing how much they're investing uh, in Brazil uh, in order to deliver the innovation ecosystem. And I'm sure that we can keep discussing that uh, during the rest of the morning. And uh, I would like to thank everybody for participating in the discussion. I hope you've all enjoyed it. Thank you.